Good afternoon. Let me uh, welcome you to the 2016 edition of the Larry Adair Lectureship. On behalf of Northeastern State University, I'm pleased to welcome you. Thank you to our students, community, guests, uh, faculty, and staff for joining us today. Before we get to the speaker and the individual that will introduce the speaker, I would like to introduce the uh, past and current Larry Adair Lectureship Scholarship recipients. So first we have with us, and they can just kind of stand, and then uh, Annie in a little bit I'll ask you to come down. But we have uh, Annie Lindsay. Where are you? There's Annie. Sarah Claus. Yeah. Rachel Hyatt. And so I guess that's, and then, oh, Taylor Eversall. I'm sorry, Taylor. I missed you. Pardon me. And then, Annie, in just a moment before, but before I invite you to come down to, to do your introduction, I would like to say just a couple of things about the namesake for today, uh, former speaker of the Oklahoma House of Representatives, Larry Adair. Larry is here today with his wife, Jan. It's so good to see both of you. We're, we're honored to have with them their, their neighbor, Gary Jackson. Gary, thank you for being here. The, this event really started, the funding for this event started in 2004 as Larry ended a 22, 22 years of service in the Oklahoma House of Representatives. Of course, two of those sessions, uh, uh, he, was, he served as the speaker. What, what sessions were those, Larry? I don't remember. Can you remember? I probably wrote it down somewhere. The 48th and 49th sessions. But yes, uh, he, he was the speaker. And upon his retirement, people that cared a lot about him and recognized his service to the state came together and they funded this initiative. This initiative that is not only now for lectureship, but is also for student scholarships. So we recognize that. Larry has two degrees from Northeastern State. They're 10 years apart, 1969 and 1979, both a bachelor's and a master's. He is a teacher at heart. Uh, he taught at uh, Steelwell and Watts, I believe, and then he went back and, and ultimately was not only a teacher, but he was a principal and superintendent. He's very much involved today at Northeastern State in his role as the chairman of the NSU Foundation, and we certainly appreciate his efforts. In fact, he was part of a large team of folks that helped us set all new records last year in school history and fundraising. So Larry continues to be very, very much involved here. You can't be in an event like this and, and not recognize someone for their military service. Larry served uh, the U.S. Army in Vietnam. Larry, thank you for your service. And in fact, any veteran that's here, thank you for your service. We're, we're so honored. With that, it is now my pleasure to uh, introduce Annie Lindsay, who will do the introduction of our speaker. So Annie, thank you. Hello, I'm so excited and honored to be here today. Uh, we are so excited to have Rilla Askew back at NSU today to talk about race in Oklahoma, from Indian Territory to the Tulsa race riots to today. Rilla is an award-winning author of Fire and Beulah, a novel about the Tulsa race riot, and most recently, Kind of Kin, a novel exploring illegal immigration in Oklahoma. Rilla's many awards can be found on the back of the bookmark you received when you came in and include the 2009 Arts and Letters Awards from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the American Book Award, and multiple Oklahoma Book Awards. Please help me welcome Rilla Askew. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I am so pleased to be here. Um, one of the things that the, the introductions haven't said is that I was a student here at Northeastern in the 1970s. Um, my heart is in Tahlequah. It's at Northeastern. I didn't graduate from here. In fact, I did something I would not recommend to any of you or your students to do. I quit school 12 hours away from a degree. Uh, I did. But I was young and foolish. And, uh, so, and, then I, and, and one of the things that happened is that I, I was a special education major while I was here, which I loved. Um, and I was also a theater minor, 
And then I began to fall a little more and more in love with theater and uh, came to realize that special education, though I love and admire it, was not my calling. So what I did was um, move to TU and finished up my degree in theater there, and then moved to New York to pursue an acting career. That's what I thought I was going to do. But things took me on a little different path, as life often does. But I'm here today to talk about um, about race in Oklahoma. And if you've seen some of the posters that have been around, perhaps you sort of look at, at this pale complexion and you go, what's she got to say about all that? And, and why her? And, um, and I think that's a really legitimate question. And, and it's, 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 it's the kind of question that has, in fact, informed my, um, my life as an American. And it has certainly informed my life as an Oklahoman and as a novelist who writes about Oklahoma. So that's some of the things that I want to share with you today because I think of Oklahoma always as a wounded place. And in my view, the whole country is wounded and I think we see that on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, yet Oklahoma, because of how we began here, really grounded in uh, hope and greed, in violence and such promise. So we're wounded in a very particular way. From the Trail of Tears, to the all-black towns, to the rush of white settlement during the land runs, the coming together of black, white, and indigenous peoples here in the Indian Territory created a racial cauldron that boiled over in brutal ways, both large and small, in the first part of the 20th century. A hundred years later, we're still living out that legacy, whether we know it or not. Some of us don't know it. Wendell Berry, that great American poet, writer, and thinker, called racism America's hidden wound. When I quote that quote from Wendell Berry, I usually qualify it to say, hidden from white people. Americans of color have not found racism to be especially well hidden. I believe, though, that it was white people that Wendell Berry was writing to. It's who I'm writing to. Um, and I've, I've, it's taken me a long time to understand that. I didn't know it for a long time. And much of my journey as a writer, and my journey as an American, and my journey as an Oklahoman has been in coming to understand that. And I think that, in part, it's because I grew up when I did, the 1960s, and where I did, Oklahoma, that I'm always looking to peel back the scab, dig underneath the scars. Scott Malcolmson, in his study of race in America, One Drop of Blood, writes of what he calls the great experiment of race in Oklahoma. He speaks of what he calls America's three founding races, black, white, and Indian. And he returns again and again to Oklahoma in this work to examine how these forces of this thing we call race unfolded here in this place. Race, of course. Is not a thing, but it is a thing. It's not a thing in a biological sense. The scientists, the biologists will tell us that there is no such thing as race. Biologically, we are all identical to one another. Culturally, though, it is a thing. It's something that we know or that we believe that we know intuitively. It shapes our entire understanding of the world in this country, in this state, acutely. Although, like gravity, a lot of times we don't think anything about it. We don't notice how it shapes our entire view of the world. At least, let me say, for those of us in the dominant culture, that has been true. As a young person growing up in this state, inside the dominant culture, I had no idea how dramatic, how singular that story of race, as we call it, was in my home state. This is the land that gave birth to 20th century's American premier athlete, a Sac and Fox Indian, Jim Thorpe, our definitive white working man's hero, Woody Guthrie, one of our most celebrated black novelists, Ralph Ellison, and the nation's deadliest pogrom, the Tulsa race riot, all within a dozen years and 100 miles of each other. Oklahoma is the only place anywhere that ever spawned a committed struggle to create an all-black state, to create an all-Indian state, the state of Sequoia. 
And yet the very first laws enacted by our Oklahoma State Legislature when we became a state were Jim Crow laws, laws of segregation. They segregated the rail cars. They seg segregated the education system. They made it illegal for any person not of that same race to teach. Not only did they segregate the schools, but they made it illegal for a white person to teach um, uh, Negro, which was the, the, the term at the time, children in any school in Oklahoma. So those, that paradox, that coming together, that clash is part of what created who, who we are. And still we have more incorporated black towns in Oklahoma than any state in the, in the Union. Still, as you all know, we have more native tribes here that survive and thrive than anywhere on the continent. But with the added irony that in Oklahoma, in the land of the red people, which I'm sure you all know, uh, mean, is what the word Oklahoma means. It comes from two Choctaw words, Okla, meaning people, and Homa, meaning red. Um, Indian people, as, as nations, have lost their tribal lands, most of their land. So Oklahoma's history is a, is a compressed miniature of the national narrative, unfolding here in a matter of days and weeks and months, sometimes just hours rather than decades, beginning with the Trail of Tears. Our school children here in Oklahoma are given a sanitized version of that history. The Trail of Tears is not mentioned in our history books for what it really was. The United States' largest scale, government sanctioned, bureaucratically administered program of ethnic cleansing. Native people died by the thousands on the removals, and some of the histories tell us that, but they don't often mention how, within only a few de decades after that suffering, this new Indian territory was legislated out of Indian hands. We celebrate again and again the dramatic reenactments of the land runs, but we aren't told what those runs meant to the tribal people already settled here. We learn about Oklahoma's oil boom, but not about the Osage Reign of Terror, where dozens of Indian people were assassinated for the sake of oil greed. Now, I, I grew up Southern Baptist here, and um, I was never even taught, I don't know if this would be in the history books, but I did learn it from a history book, not a school history book, that the very first Baptist church in Oklahoma was started by two African Americans, one Native American, and one Anglo American, somewhere over around by Muskogee. And I thought, that blending of those cultures here is just so quintessential for Oklahoma's story. And it is, in some ways, the American story. So despite the clash and the difficulties and the violence, there's also always been this form of unity that has also happened here. I grew up in Bartlesville. And um, in all the time that I was growing up there, I, we had really good schools. I had very good education. But I was always taught an extremely, um, I guess I would say, stereotyped version of Oklahoma history. It was as if it was a binary. We had Indians and we had whites. And the Indians we had on the Trail of Tears only up through the Trail of Tears. Then we had the land runs. Then we had Oklahoma history. Um, and that was, that, you know, I don't know if that's exactly how they taught it to me, but it's certainly what I came away from it with. And um, so I had no idea how African American people even came to Oklahoma. Um, in, in all my years uh, growing up. I mean, I went to school. Um, we have finally had desegregation by the time I was in high school, and I went to school with black kids, but I had no idea what their story was. I didn't really even know my own family's story about how we came here. So I knew we didn't, they didn't come on the land runs. Um, I didn't know that they had come as illegal immigrants, which is really what happened. They came in, to, uh, in the 1800s um, in, in covered wagons, uh, most of them from Mississippi, some of them from Kentucky, and they came and settled in Indian territory um, when they were white people and had no real legal right to own land. So, um, but those are stories that I found out a lot, lot later. These are not the things certainly that I was taught in school. And I didn't understand that, that the very first African American people came here as the enslaved people of the tribes that came on the Trail of Tears. And so the first ones came as, um, they, they came on the trail with, the, with Cherokee people, Choctaw, Chickasaw, uh, Muscogee Creek, and Seminole. Um, although I, in, in going back and studying a little bit of the history, I realized, I, I learned that probably at least the first recorded African person who came through, came through in the 1500s with um, uh, Cabeza de Vaca. Um, the, uh, on the Spanish um, explorations when the Spaniards came through um, in uh, this part of, of, of the North Americas looking for Cibola and the seven cities of gold. Um, and he, he was recorded in the history books. 
But, but the history that I was received, it was as if this land was like a tabla rasa, like no people lived here before, and then we had the Trail of Tears, and then we had the land runs, and that's how it, how it all happened. And so I was never taught about the Caddo people, the Wichita people, for whom this was um, their traditional uh, uh, lands. I didn't know that even it was uh, Osage hunting territory. I didn't know it was Cherokee uh, hunting territory well before the removals. None of those things were taught to me. But I think the place that was uh, where I felt I feel now that my education was most lacking was in this was in the study of black history in Oklahoma. Um, it was this, it was a, it was a tremendous void, and um, I didn't really think about those things much. You know, I, I grew up during the civil rights years, and so I cared about these issues. But it didn't occur to me to question how those how those forces happened here. And uh, it didn't occur to me to really to question anything about it. We had, I grew up in an era that was very biased. There was a great deal of segregation um, in Bartlesville. All African American people lived in one section of town. No white person lived there. And that was how it was. I didn't, I didn't think to even question those things. And I think that that's unfortunately the condition for, for many of us. Uh, when, when we grow up with conditions that, we, that seem to be the norm, that we come to believe are the norm, we don't, we don't question why, why this is so. And I think probably my, one of those changes, the, how would you say, kind of consciousness raising that began to happen for me, began after I came to Tahlequah. I came to, to school here, and, um, and it was really being um, connected to Cherokee people here, um, I, to having, having deep friendships, um, being connected to a new way of looking at the world. I, for a couple of summers, I danced out at the Trail of Tears when, where, when they had the outdoor drama out there. And I came to understand that there were many, many other forces uh, at work and that there was a different way of looking at the world than just through the dominant culture eyes which I had been raised with. And I, I had, like many of us in this um, part of the world, many of us in Oklahoma, the stories of being part Cherokee on my grandfather's side, I'm on my father's side, and part Choctaw on my mother's side, uh, the, but those heritages were never traced. And, um, and that's an important, how would you say, it's a port, an important identification. But what happened for me is that at being given that knowledge or that, uh, that story that came down in the families, um, it might have changed some things. It didn't change the privilege that I was raised with. It didn't change the fact that I grew up white with all the privileges and presumptions of whiteness. And in fact, if anything, it might have given me a little sense of forgiveness uh, because I, well, I had these stories that I, I was also part Indian and so maybe I wasn't entirely white and so maybe all the things that white people did, I don't really have to own all those things. I don't know that I consciously thought those things, but I think I may have unconsciously thought those things. So. Um, when I um, began to do some more study and began to understand uh, how African American people came here uh, initially um, as the enslaved people of the, the, what we call, what the dominant culture calls the five civilized tribes, um, I came to understand, and this was also from at, at dancing out at trail and beginning to know more about Cherokee history, that it was because of the Civil War. That was the excuse. No, I, I knew that about the Allotment Act. I knew about the Trail of Tears, and I knew that all of Indian Territory belonged to the, to the, the, first, the, the initial five tribes. And then I knew about the Allotment Act that happened in the uh, late 1800s that broke the tribal lands up into individual allotments, and that that was the process that was used um, really to legislate. You know, Woody Guthrie said, some folks will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. And uh, this was, a, 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 in my view, a, a, one of those fountain pen robberies. But uh, what I didn't know was the catalyst for that. Now, we know about treaties. We know that a lot of treaties were made and a lot of treaties were broken. But here was this great removal to Indian Territory in the 1830s um, of, of these great tribal nations. And the, water, and the land was supposed to be belong to the people as long as the grass shall grow and the waters run. And so how did it happen that such a short time later this change happened? Um, and the, uh, other, the, the Cherokee Strip was taken away from the Cherokees. A lot of the Western lands were taken away from the tribes that were, that, to whom it was first given. And I never really understood that it was the Civil War that was the catalyst for that. 
And because the nations, and those of you who live here in Cherokee Nation know this more than probably other audiences I might talk to, um, when, because, because the nations were divided and some sided with the Confederacy and some sided with the Union, after the Civil War, the, the federal government treated it as if all of the tribes um, had sided with the Confederacy. And so they, they did the same kinds of things here, um, that not, not exactly, but, but similar kinds of things as to what, what they did with Reconstruction in the South. And so as many of you know, um, um, the, the five tribes were um, forced to free their slaves and enroll them in the tribes as en enrolled members, and these became the, what we call the freedmen. And that's a controversy that exists to this day, um, certainly in Cherokee Nation, it, it exists in Choctaw Nation. and. Um, there are a lot of complications about all those things, but it was also the excuse to free up those lands out west, to take away the lands that had been, you know, you hear about the Cherokee Strip, it, had, it was Cherokee land um, out west, and it was, that was the excuse, uh, the reason, you would say, the federal government, to take those lands away and to, first of all, give them to other tribes that they removed here from, whoops, from all around the continent, um, but also um, to open up that land ultimately to white settlement out in Oklahoma Territory, the western half of the state. So the point that I'm making with all that is that we cannot, the Civil War was about slavery. I know people talk, some people talk about it being about states' rights and there are all kinds of other elements that were uh, a, a part of it, but fundamentally it was about the issue of slavery. And so we shed, the, much blood was shed all, all around the country, and much blood was shed here in Oklahoma, and much blood was shed in, in Cherokee Nation. And it, was, and it stemmed all around this thing we call race. It still stemmed from the issue of slavery. So we can't ever separate ourselves from those stories. Um, we can't separate the narrative of Oklahoma or the narrative of the country from those conditions. So growing up here, I had never heard of the Tulsa race riot. And I, I suspect, in fact, I, th I would just like to go to a show of hands. When you were growing up and in your education here, how many of you did hear about the Tulsa race riot? Okay, how many of you did not? It looks almost about like half, but I would say, I can't see all of you, but I would say that it looks to me like those of you who are younger and have received your education um, in more recent years may be more likely to be the, the population who's heard about it. In any case, I grew up 50 miles from there in Bartlesville and hadn't heard one word about it. And when I finally learned about it, I was, I was in many ways devastated. I learned about it in 1989, and that was before um, the, the Tulsa Race Riot Commission. It was before the, the state had begun to become willing to look at that old history. Um, I found out about it by reading a biography of the great African-American novelist Richard Wright. And uh, I lived in Brooklyn then, and I, and I called my sister in Tulsa, and I said, did you know there was a race riot in Tulsa in 1921? And she said, yeah, I knew that. And I said, well, why do you know it and I don't know it? Because, you know, my grandma taught Oklahoma history. I thought I should know this. And she said, um, Vashta told me. Vashta was her husband's grandmother, and she had been a young girl on the outside edge of the Tulsa race right when she was, when she was young. And her father came and got her and took her in a wagon. He, she didn't see the actual events of the riot, but he took her in a wagon around um, the areas that had been burned uh, during the riot, and she saw not only the devastation and the aftermath and the smoking ruins, she saw bodies, many, many bodies of black people. She saw, she told my sister Ruth that she saw bodies of black people being burned in New Block Park on the banks of the Illinois, of, of the Arkansas River. And that little Freudian slip, Illinois River did I say? <laughs> I'm back in Tahlequah, uh, the Arkansas River. So um, why, would she, why would she tell this? To, this, she told this to Ruth in the 1970s, not long after Ruth and Bill got married, um, if she didn't actually see it. She saw it, and that was when the history was still um, very much being hidden. So I, I have to say that the fact that I didn't know about the, the Tulsa race riot isn't surprising. It's really not any different from most of the white um, people that uh, I would say of my generation or older, because the silence surrounding it um, has been and was, back in the day, really absolute. But the thing is, in all those years when I was growing up here and never heard a word about it, I didn't know about it. Black people knew about it. It was handed down orally in black families. 
And uh, not all of them, certainly. I, I've, I've talked to African-American friends who say, my, my, my grandmother wouldn't tell me about it. And when I found out about it, I said, why didn't you tell me? And she said, I didn't want you to be bitter, or I didn't want it to you know, go against you in some way. And you're, I, it, I didn't want you to hate white people. Um, so it did, wasn't handed down in all families, but it was handed down in many families. And so when I think about why the wounds of race in this country won't heal, I think about that. I think about how for generations, whites and blacks lived and worked in close proximity with the African American people knowing what happened in Tulsa in 1921 and white people not knowing anything about it. I think that that's the nature of the chasm between us and I think it still exists. That's the legacy we're still living out not only in Oklahoma, but all over the country. Just look at the news in the past two or three years, and you can see we're still living it out. We're living out our birthrights of slavery, genocide, our homegrown brand of terrorism, massacres, and lynchings. Those things happen right here in Oklahoma. They happened all over the country. We're still living out Wounded Knee, Jim Crow. We're still suffering the long herd of the boarding schools, the theft of Indian children through forced adoption.